It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Pan Engineering Technology Business and Government Lecture Series. Um, as many of you know, this series brings distinguished visitors to the Penn campus to interact with our students, with our faculty on a broad range of issues, issues that affect uh, science and technology, uh, research development and commercialization in technology, and then policy making to promote technology development. Today we are fortunate to have our speaker, Patrick T. Harker, the 11th President and the Chief Executive Officer of the Fed Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. Pat is one of us. He's an honored alumnus and a good friend of Penn Engineering and the university. Having earned all of his degrees, including several in Penn Engineering. These degrees include a PhD in Civil and Urban Engineering, a MA in Economics, MSc and BSc in Civil Engineering. In addition, Pat was on the faculties of both the Wharton School and Penn Engineering. He served as department chair in both schools and as a dean at Wharton. Pat left Penn in 2007 to become the 26th president of the University of Delaware, where he was also a professor of business administration at the Alfred Lerner College of Business and Economics and a professor of civil and environmental engineering at the College of Engineering. Over the course of his career, Pat has received many honors and awards. And this impressive list includes being named the Fellow of INFORMS, the Institute for Operations Research and Management Sciences, a Charter Fellow of the National Academy of Inventors, and a White House Fellow. I should also mention that Pat served as a Special Assistant to the FBI Director William Sessions from 1991 to 1992. In his spare time, not that he had spare time, he published and edited nine books and over 100 professional articles on a wide range of esoteric subjects, including variational inequality and nonlinear complementarity problems. No, these problems are not about giving compliments. It's about <laughs> complementarity problems and generalized Nash games. He also served as the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Operations Research, which is the premier journal in operations research. President Harker's talk today is entitled, FinTech, Is It Revolution or Just Evolution? Please join me in welcoming President Harker back to Penn Engineering. Well, thanks. It's great to be home. Thanks so much uh, for having me here, and it's a real pleasure to be on campus. And we don't think variational equality theory is that esoteric or uh, complementary, so uh, we've worked in that area uh, over the years together. So it's great, BJ. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, to be part of this. So why am I here? Uh, why is a Fed, what's a Fed president doing talking to all of you uh, here in the engineering school? And I suppose it goes to the title of the lecture, Technology, Business, and Government. There is so much overlap in that it makes sense uh, to look at the ways they're intertwined. It's like a three-legged stool of modern e-commerce that you'll undoubtedly encounter, especially the students, in whatever profession you pursue. So as Vijay said, I started out as an engineer. I'm now the president of the Philly Fed. And I think those paths that you will take in life are just, you will not know, you don't know today. Uh, where this education will take you. And I think that's the beauty of this education, that it opens up all sorts of doors uh, to you. So I found uh, some of the theoretical insights I had from variational inequality theory, complementary theory, systems engineering, those are applicable to, that way of thinking is applicable uh, to many areas, including economics and commerce. So the principles I learned right here come in handy, from complex adaptive systems to robust control, to the Lucas critique in macroeconomics. Although, while engineers focus, really are comfortable, their sweet spot is focusing on things that say are 95% accurate and worry about that 5% inaccuracy, I've noticed that a lot of my colleagues in economics on the other side of the issues, uh, we're called a dismal science for a reason. Uh, we, that 5% is the place we live very often and uh, we're looking for these black swans, right? We're looking for those patterns 
in that 5%. So uh, my colleagues and I are comfortable in that space. And as I, I should mention, my colleagues, uh, this is the standard disclaimer for a Federal Reserve speech. The remarks I make today are mine alone and do not represent anyone in the Federal Reserve System or in the Federal Open Market Committee. That's out of the way. So let's talk about substance. I'd like to briefly outline what, uh, what I do, give a quick economic update and outlook, and then talk specifically about the issue of fintech, this increasingly interesting conversation we're having around fintech. So this is something that really does touch all three legs of this stool, technology, business, and government. And it's an area, particularly for the students, that you may find yourself working in or alongside of in your career. So let's start with a very basic overview of the Federal Reserve System for those that don't live and breathe this every day. The, Federal, the Fed is a uniquely American institution. We are a decentralized central bank. It's truly unique in the context of central banking in the world. We have 12 regional banks around the country and a board of governors in Washington, D.C. We vote on policy roughly every six weeks, which now mostly consists of decisions on whether or not to raise interest rates, or in our case, the Fed funds rate. We make monetary policy, which should not be confused with other types of policy, fiscal policy, tax policy, and other policies. We focus on a dual mandate, the dual mandate that is given to us by Congress, which is to have maximum employment and price stability. Translated, look at our unemployment to get it below or at the natural rate of unemployment and to have moderate inflation. Now, we don't make these decisions uh, without taking into account other issues that the government is facing, like debts and deficits, taxes, and so forth. But we, in monetary policy, don't control those. And I think it's very important to know what we do and what we don't do. So in our world, we control monetary policy, but those other issues, those fiscal issues, really reside in the hands of other elected officials. So, in general, if you don't hear a lot about us, uh, that's a good thing because it means that things are just humming along, and, and usually you don't hear much about us unless we've actually done something. And so there was a lot of discussion about the Fed in the last month because we raised rates in the last meeting 25 basis points, and that was only the third time we've raised rates since we lowered them to near zero in the midst of the Great Recession. You know, the, the second largest um, economic dislocation since the Great Depression. So, let's talk a little bit about that. Why are we starting to raise rates? For me, it's, it made sense to make that move, given the data that we're seeing. The labor market has shown steady improvement, and at 4.7% unemployment, that rate is near or at what I would consider possibly slightly below what I would consider the natural rate of unemployment uh, in the economy. We've created 235,000 jobs in February, and we're averaging 200,000 jobs a month over the past 12 months. Wage growth has ticked up, which is something I've been looking for. Average hourly, hourly earnings increased 2.8% over the past 12 months. So the labor market feels like it's moving, moving steadily toward increasing health. And you see that in other measures, too. Job openings remain high, layoffs remain at almost historic lows, and more people are quickly are quitting jobs. Now, this is one of the quirky measures, quitting jobs. It's what we call the JOLTS data, job openings and quits data. It's one of the measures we focus on, I focus on. It's a good indication of how people in the economy view the economy. They're not going to quit a job, generally, unless they think they can get another job. And so it's a good sense of the, the fluidity in the labor markets. That's a good thing for the U.S. economy. So labor markets feel good. On the inflation side of things, the momentum continues to be in the right direction. Inflation has been persistently below our 2% target, but it's moving slowly but surely upward. We're on the right track to reach our goal by the end of this year or the beginning of next, in my estimation. Recently, GDP growth has been driven largely by consumption, and I continue to forecast just above 2% growth for the year. Now, I am on record saying that I view three rate hikes as appropriate in this year, 2017, 
assuming things stay on track. And I still think that's the right call for now. I continue to believe they should be gradual, both in pace and increments. Now, I don't want to get behind the curve. Uh, that's inflation. There's a dynamic of inflation that once we move rates, it takes a while for the economy uh, to move. But I don't want to get behind that curve, but I don't think we need to rush either. I consider every meeting to be live, and that gives us plenty of opportunity over the course of the rest of the year if we need to move rates. Now, we say all the time that our decisions are data dependent. So I will continue to be looking at the information as it comes in to see if I modify my trajectory, my forecast. But for now, I think a few more rate increases this year are appropriate. So that's my, my take on the economy, where we are. I think the economy, while not perfect everywhere, is healthy and moving toward increasing health. So what does that have to do with the topic of today, FinTech? The obvious answer is that we deal with the banking system. The other is that we deal with money. You could argue we are money, uh, and then we define what money is. And so there's a lot of interest in the Federal Reserve System, in my team, in the Philly Fed, on issues related to FinTech, and in particular, digital currencies. What impact might a digital currency have, and how do I, as a monetary policymaker, view it in the context of my responsibilities? But before I get into that, I want to take a step back and first consider what exactly currency is and how, or rather why, it works. The underpinning of currency, like the financial system itself, is trust. It's trust. A fiat currency like that of the United States which is issued by a central bank in a secure and stable economy, works because we trust it. A dollar is a dollar. And the reason you believe that that dollar in your pocket is worth a dollar is because uh, it's backed by the central bank of this nation. We all agree that it's a dollar, and it takes a lot to shake that faith, right? Because we have this trust. You know, we experience inflation. In the 70s, we experienced very high inflation, sure. But typically, it's not dramatic or abrupt. And so we, we trust that that dollar is worth a dollar. On the other hand, one of the things you'll see with digital currency is how wildly the value swings. The question is, will there ever be a digital currency that is stable enough to become as widely used as a government one? Research by my staff indicates that privately issued currencies can lead to unstable mon money supply and depreciation of the currency. Why? Because there's no fundamental guarantee of its value in the same way there is with currency issued by the central bank of a credible and stable government. So unless the government issues it, the answer is likely that no, digital currencies won't drive out our own anytime soon. And while some governments are exploring the possibility of producing their own digital currencies, several hurdles remain, as my colleague, Governor Powell, outlined recently in his speech. Those include technical challenges, the unprecedented risk of cyber attacks, potential for criminal activity like money laundering, and threats to privacy. Then there's blockchain. Blockchain has tremendous potential, and banks can use it to further manage risk. From my perspective, however, its real value is in authentication, not on distributing a virtual currency. And the implications of having a distributed ledger that offers virtually fail-safe data storage are huge on the risk management side of not just banking, but really of any business. So there's definitely some very interesting and potentially game-changing innovation coming out of FinTech. But FinTech overall is actually just natural market evolution. And the assumptions about disruption, or indeed creative destruction, are, with apologies to the economist Schumpeter, probably out of proportion. Part of the reason things can look like a revolution instead of an evolution is that we're viewing them in isolation. If you look along the broad history of an industry, you can put things into context. You see the way banking evolved its products and appendages, just like that first single cell organism evolve fins and gills and eventually feet and legs. Securitization, credit scoring, prepaid credit cards, which my team had already done about 20 studies on before anyone was paying much attention to them. Don't look, look revolutionary on the scale of FinTech. But neither does the Commodore 64 when you stand it next to a MacBook Air. Uh, 
Yet we never overlook the effect of widely available in-home computers. So while much of this is exciting, and the technology is very, very cool, I always warn against overstating its overall effect. This, by and large, uh, is, by and large, the same kind of evolution the banking system has seen for, say, the past 40 years. It's just a different delivery system. Now, my favorite analogy is actually peer-to-peer -peer lending. I don't know if many of you are familiar with peer-to-peer -peer lending. And there are many platforms, fintech platforms, out there competing. Well, when I grew up across the river in a small town in New Jersey, we had the same thing. We had peer-to-peer -peer lending. Only in our case, it was in some bar where Frankie asked Johnny for a 20, right? Now, what's the, the big difference was Johnny knew where Frankie lived, right? So there was an implicit trust uh, that was built into that. And as a result, a lower rate of default. And so Johnny and Frankie knew each other, and they did this all the time. But overall, you think about it, we're talking about the same concept that happened then, but just applied to a new technology and a broader market. But it's the same basic concept. In fact, what un underpins the Frankie and Johnny scenario and banking and lending in general is, again, this fundamental principle of trust. In the grand scheme of things, as innovations enter and leave markets, the ones that survive in any good business, but especially in banking, are the ones that engender trust. We trust that the cash we take out of an ATM is US currency that has an agreed upon value, that holds its value. We trust that when we want to access our bank accounts, the funds will be there, that the funds will be available. We trust that when we access credit, that the terms and conditions we agree to will be followed by both parties. FinTech may be a major player, but people have to be able to put their trust in it. And it has to prove its value to markets and ultimately to the consumer. Now, we're hosting a conference uh, at the Philly Fed in September that's going to focus exactly on this subject. What's the end result in the efficient functioning of markets and in benefit to consumers with this evolution, this revolution? What's the benefit in consumer surplus that any of these innovations create? Now, more research from the Philly Fed indicates that its initial findings are that for the same risk of default, consumers pay smaller spreads on loans from fintech companies than from traditional lenders. Now, that is something, of course, that adds value, real value, to a lot of people. The question of trust and value, of course, is a basic business principle, which leads me to the next leg of the stool. What do these developments mean for business? If FinTech is wildly successful, if we all abandon tellers and ATMs, are banks going away? And this question hangs out there in the air. Policymakers don't like to make predictions because the future has a funny way of defying expectations. But in this instance, I'll go out on a limb and say, no, banks aren't going anywhere. Now, it is true that out of every innovation, a little disintermediation must fall. And sure, some roles and functions will be made obsolete, but that happens with all progress. The changes in the banking system over the past 40 years have continually pushed some players out at the same time they're steadily bringing others in. This is just part of the natural evolution of a market. With banks, I think it's more a case, uh, if you think about that evolution, the best analogy I can give you, it's more a case of the real estate agent than the travel agent. Now, what do I mean by that? What's the analogy? With the advent of e-commerce back in the 90s, both travel and housing markets were affected, disrupted. But only one of them saw the demise of one set of intermediaries. Travel agents largely disappeared because we all know what we went out of a flight, a hotel, a, vac a vacation. It's something we do often enough and are familiar enough with to trust our own instincts. The risks are small. Buying a plane ticket isn't inexpensive. But Let's put it in perspective. It's a low-risk proposition in the grand scheme of things. And the value that travel agents brought can be largely re replaced by our own internet research. In this case, the web did replace travel agents as our intermediaries. Now, contrast that to real estate agents. We still have real estate agents. 
even though I can get a 360 degree view of a house that's five states away from the comfort of my living room, we still have real estate agents. Why? Well, the only explanation I can give is because real estate agents add some sort of value. They perform a fundamental service that we can't provide ourselves or can't be found online, at least not as well. People don't buy houses that often. I mean, think about how many times people buy a house versus book a vacation or a flight. They don't buy them that often. Now, I personally don't want to take the risk when I'm doing something that infrequently uh, of doing it all myself. I want a professional who knows what papers to file, what zoning laws have to be followed, what surveys should be done, and what market expectations are. Even though technology has evolved and will continue to evolve, we still, in this case, need these intermediaries. Likewise, no matter what happens in the world of fintech, you still need a trusted broker of money. The role may change and adapt, but someone needs to be the source of funds and credit. There's always going to be a place for maturity transformation, for, for instance. When people make longer-term loans, it creates a maturity mismatch on the balance sheet of the lender. This is because the liability side of the balance sheet can evaporate much more rapidly than the asset side, making the lender either illiquid or insolvent. One of the key economic contributions of banks is that they manage that risk. A fintech firm is unlikely to have that scope in long-term trust, at least not for a while. Similarly, you and I wouldn't make good credit card lenders, even if we had the right coding and the right software. So those won't completely disappear either. Now, there will be some disintermediation. I don't want to say there won't. But that's been the case in banking since deregulation started in the 1980s. At the end of the day, we still rely on those institutions to manage risk and to provide a safe haven. So this is where I want to return to the core principle. The benefit of a business or technology, the benefit that creates for markets and the consumer. Now banks know they have to focus on the functions that add value. It is easy for a well-capitalized bank to fund a startup, let it take the risks, and then adopt, acquire that successful technology. Fintechs may fully permeate the banking industry, but it will likely be in a way that sees many of the old players adapting new technologies rather than, be, than being put out of business by them. Now that relates directly to the government's part, because in a large portion of the government's role in FinTech will be regulation. Regulators have to think about how to create oversight that does not stifle innovation while simultaneously protecting markets and consumers. The fintech industry has to think about what regulation means to them. Now, I want to say here that regulation isn't a bad thing. It is necessary for a functioning system. Because if you think about it, it's one of the ways to confer the trust that is so essential in a market. And in the case of fintech, it's in the fintech firm's best interest to know what's expected from them from the very beginning. Otherwise, they may have to play catch up or retrofit their business model to comply with oversight that comes later. Not to mention, building the trust in the system that regulation can offer makes their business more resilient. Now, most fintech companies are relatively new. They haven't been through the downside of a credit cycle. And the unfortunate reality of modernity is that there will be a downside to the credit cycle. For those companies that are getting to scale where negative events could have major impacts on their business, regulation is especially important because it acts as a safety net. More importantly, regulation that comes in after a crisis almost always fights the last war. That kind of oversight is generally more restrictive and would likely put far more burden on fintech firms than starting out sooner. I want regulation that safeguards the consumer, the market, and the emerging fintech industry itself. I like innovation. I like responsible innovation more. Now that's about the long and short of it. Fintech touches many sectors and it offers some exciting ways to modernize the banking industry. It's not a radical departure in the sense that the industry has been evolving over the past several decades, but it's new and interesting in the sense of the technology it's offering. Now, I hope the value is equal to the technology, and I think it will be, because that's the story at the end. 
At the end of the day, it's about efficient market function and protecting the consumer. Thank you. And I think there's some time for some questions. Thanks.